As concern for health care grows across the world, so does the concern in Native and ethnic minority communities, especially for ways to reach out and help those who are struggling with drug or alcohol challenges, who suffer from emotional imbalances, and who may be numb to self-defeating behavior. The indigenous communities of American Indian, Alaska Native, and Pacific Island people are underrepresented in behavioral health research and in the development of interventions across the public health spectrum. When they do access care, it is often poor and culturally inappropriate, compromising the service they receive and making positive long-term change less likely. In 2009, Two indigenous organizations worked as a team to better understand practice improvement and evidence building through the lens, worldview, and voices of indigenous people themselves. Vital to this effort was understanding how the local indigenous communities viewed the role of evidence building, how they knew if, when, and why a particular service works, and what sequential steps were taken to measure whether their services met the needs of the community. Because the life experience of indigenous people is different from any other, we started by listening to the indigenous community story. We've had some problems, even though we're the same exact people, the same exact culture, um, because of the way we were divided back, back in World War II by Germany and the U.S. Um, it's like we're two totally different, <laughs> to totally different uh, countries. If you speak to uh, someone that was born and raised in Western Samoa, um, and when they speak English, um, they have a British accent. <laughs> um, they have a the school system. Their government system is is modeled after the uh, British government and school system. But other than that, the exact same culture. We're all related. Um, we all have ties to the village. I mean to. Uh, families in Western Samoa. A lot of the younger, you know, I know even when we were in high school, um, back in the early 90s, you know, a lot of my classmates, and, um, you know, just couldn't wait to graduate and go off to the U.S. Um, and some who weren't able to get scholarships or, or um, be able to move off island through education were joining the military as their way off of the island. Um, but you see many of them as they get older, um, they all um, finish school or um, probably live in the U.S. for five, ten years and then um, they all gravitate back to the island. They all retire here or they come back in their, when they're in their 30s and 40s wanting to move home. We're seeing a lot of suffering in this country, not just in the American Indian population, but in many populations because there's that lack of connectedness to one another. We don't see a global community. We don't see really a, a community in this country. We have a lot of divisions. And I think that if we look at some of the traditional philosophies and some of the traditional approaches to how we should live our lives as human beings, there's a great deal of benefit for the rest of the, the nation and the rest of the world to, to gain if they understand more of a communitarian philosophy and more of an approach of recognizing and respecting one another as human beings. We're calling these this overlap of uh, projects joint discussions on best practices for indigenous people. We, we, we regard ourselves as pretty tiny. Um, but tininess is comparative. And uh, 20 years ago, we were in considerable trouble. Our government didn't recognize the importance of mental health. And mental health is not like broken legs. Well, I mean, people don't see how important mental health is. And it's a bit like the glue for society. Of our uh, Pacific population suffering from mental disorder, living in New Zealand, um, it's the New Zealand boards that, uh, that are bearing the burden. And that raised um, some really big uh, questions for me. What is it about our island-born parents that migrated to New Zealand that makes them more resilient to mental disorder than the New Zealand-born populations? So we came up with the idea of um, starting IIMHL, the International Initiative of Mental Health Leadership, 
trying to see whether we could promote leadership development. And the first way that we did it is we designed a leadership exchange. What we hope emerges from that is that those leaders develop a relationship so that each leader has their own international partnership. The conventional mainstream approach to providing behavioral health care has not met the needs of indigenous young people and their families. There is general agreement among all behavioral health professionals that we must improve how services are offered to indigenous communities and the services need to result in improved outcomes. One of the very first and foremost uh, possibilities in reaching young people is creating that common language, finding that common language so dialogue could happen. You know, I think it's very important for uh, professional people to stay rooted in what it is to be young and living within uh, that, that urban environment. The kids, the youth are very savvy, street culture, they know they have to survive, you know, so they have to be tough, they're rough and tough and they have to survive on the street. So they've learned that in this generation. The youth are so in tune to st staying safe that they are so focused on understanding the negativity of the community. And that is what's guiding them to be survivalist among the community. By finding that middle ground, by having a common dialogue, by working within what the youth are doing is going to lead to long-term prevention, intervention, and treatment. The history of the tribes that have been at the table, at the state table, has it's been a majority of uh, the larger tribes with a lot of resources. But what we've done is we've begun to start building relationships with some of the smaller tribes. And what happens is tribes, tribal programs, they meet one another. It becomes an a form for information sharing partnerships, not always with the state and tribes, sometimes it's intertribal. Knowledge of culture influences when and how people seek help, who they want help from, how long they stay in treatment, and how they renew their cultural self as a way to heal. Indigenous people have long said that the reason they don't use or stay with mainstream services is because the non-native service provider doesn't understand their culture. Understanding the unique life experiences of those you serve and the transformative power and healing that can come from reconnecting with one's culture was a fundamental principle. Minto, the village used to be uh, all hand work. People will all get together and help build us. So this is like an all hand built store. It's pretty dark in there, but this is our root cellar here. This is where we keep all our Perishables. The camp started out a tragedy and, uh, and, and grew from there. A couple young boys, they drowned it, and then all the people from our surrounding areas come to that location and they stay there until they find those bodies. Some of the people that came were, used alcohol a lot and were very dependent on it, and they started going through withdrawals at that location or the severity of the withdrawals were reduced by the environment and by their own foods. Fish rack, two poles hanging on top of that and more poles hanging across there and they hang the fish on it. Then they take it in the smokehouse so it can smoke it. Like this is willow and on the side of it in the summertime or early summer, other side of that it's fuzzy and it's white and the leaves are green. When you get stung by a bee, you take it and chew it up and mash it up and put it on that bee sting. That's what we use for medicine to draw out the poison. A lot of our clients are urban people that have no background in their culture. We try to uh, bring them back to what their culture is and uh, teach them about spiritual healing connection between the land and nature and how it's uh, the healing process. When they get here, they don't have the um, muscles to do anything hard. They even pack a five gallon bucket, but then by the time they leave here, they're carrying two buckets at a time. 
and you know it just builds up their self-esteem and their muscles and they exactly know what to do now. These new cabins built are all built on uh, the original location where people had their homes. This is our cabin that we stayed in this session. This is our work area, another work area. Our washeteria where we wash up in the morning. And as you see our laundry, we do laundry and we hang it up. We make our own fire. It's not really going around much now. I learned a lot from being here. Being here the, the last time I was here, you know, I, I practiced a lot about of what I learned here on my, you know, on my own. It's good to be out in the um, open because other treatments that I've been to is like um, you're just locked up in a, a building and you can't do nothing. Here you could go out and chop wood, pack water. I really enjoy this place and I'm learning a lot about my culture, which I really never knew before. This is one of the unique uh, recovery camps for families, especially. Uh, you see the children here that uh, uh, people can bring their families here to recovery and everybody go through that process and here at the camp and I think this is a unique situation. Early 90s I believe we had a real big cold snap and it got it was over 60 below. During that cold spree we couldn't keep all the cabins warm. We had to come together and figure out how were we going to keep all the cabins heated. We didn't know how long that cold spell was going to last. We did know that nobody was going to be flying in if it didn't get warmer than 40, and we were seeing 60 degrees below zero. And one of the things that they really had to do out there was not only unite and to work together to survive this severe weather condition, but also show the responsibility and the care for one another. The unity that was established out there during that time that could not be created in an office setting like this, where there's four walls. The ability to build and maintain local credibility for their service was key. So it's really good for the children to hear about this stuff before it even occurs. But she sits in with my groups and she learns about all the alcoholism and the inhalants and all the addictions that are out there. We do family counseling with each other, so it's really good. It's a really good program. They don't leave the kids out at all. I volunteer a lot. I go out to the communities a lot, to our different tribal communities, and I feel like that's one of the major ways that I'm building trust. Recognizing the meaningfulness of connecting with the spirituality of indigenous people was also part of their approach to best practice. If, if we look at substance abuse, and if you believe that uh, substance abuse has a spiritual nature to it and that once that's removed you have this big void in this person's life and the only way that you can fill that void is by replacing it with something positive what our people believed in is when they were developing these, these programs was our, that they were going to fill that with the tradition and culture of our, of our, our, and our customs when we start a training or we start any event, we always implement it through prayer. And um, we finish it out with, you know, usually food, the wupila. And um, it's, you know, just a way to honor um, all of our community members and the people that we serve and really try to implement a very home, family-based um, center. We are taught to be a people of prayer. And so we do that, and we're still practicing, trying to hold on to and preserve the traditional ways through praying with the community. It's important to understand that services for indigenous communities are often part of a broader nation-building context. That is, services are not merely services, they're part of what's needed to build strong nations and futures for indigenous and native people. I could sit with young people and they can assess their community and tell you for days on end about the negativity in the community, the problems in the community, the violence in the community, the gangs in the community, and the drugs in the community. Uh, but the youth, when you start talking about what are the strengths and supports of the community, what are those, what are those ideas or programs or, or philosophies that are helping them 
uh, gravitate to staying healthy, uh, that list and dialogue and conversation is, is all but maybe seven minutes. There's a lot of negativity in their language, there's a lot of shame, uh, there's a lot of uh, wanting to just escape, uh, and then that leads to the social acceptance of drug use or drinking in our community. By using the idea of how do we increase a language of health, we are promoting an alternative worldview that they can look at their community and, and say, well, what is working in the community and how can we hold on with two hands and not fall prey to the negativities. Just living in Alaska, you have to learn how to adapt. It's about survival and being in the village there because you have to be, be very dependent upon one another to work as a team, uh, to work as a whole community, to get all the needs met. So it's like the, everybody becomes an aunt and uncle to the whole family system. One of the major things in, in trying to look forward to the days where we can contract on a regular basis uh, with tribes is to be able to understand how to do that appropriately because they are sovereign nations. And since it wasn't normally hardly ever done, uh, people didn't really know how to do that. The team gained much insight into the indigenous community perspective on evidence building. Some indigenous communities felt no need to prove the effectiveness of their program through data believing instead that the local community support is all the evidence they need. Others have become expert in ways to document their local program effectiveness while staying alert to the dynamic of difference between indigenous and evaluation worldviews. People knew what they were doing. You know, our staff knew what they were doing, and with a little support, they were able to articulate it, to talk about it at conferences and seminars, and to write about it. I thought that was very important to build that capacity of uh, Indian people to articulate what works, what's successful. That sometimes were practiced for many, many thousands of years, but just weren't validated in typical Western protocols. Some felt there was a way to bring all of the collective resources to the table. So when you can incorporate the Western practices with culture, you're getting best of the both worlds in providing treatment. Historical and cultural understanding of indigenous communities is also critical for the healthcare provider because the past influences the future and a cultural context for clinical assessment, diagnosis, and treatment is paramount. Building behavioral health practices on a cultural foundation was critical. We're at a point in history right now where the convergence of traditional philosophies and prophecies are, are merging with opportunities for tribes to expand their control over their own health systems. A lot of the research and a lot of things we know what's going on in terms of historical trauma, our tribal communities are starting to turn to that and starting to realize, recognize the importance of recognizing historical trauma and intergenerational trauma. One thing that I always like to bring to the table is that we're not complaining, we're just explaining. This is not a time for us to attack anybody, but just process what happened and see what happened, where we, how we got to where we are, and what we can do to make steps to change things. And you, you introduce culture to the youth. You introduce culture, whether it's a song or whether it's a drum or a burning some sage or something like that. Um, the kids say like, hmm, that reminds me of something. You know, they may not have learned culture, Indian culture in this generation, but they were back and forth to the res two or three times in their lives. You know, they talk with their grandma and grandpa and auntie and uncle. And so when they're approached with the culture, they connect to their roots. This is our clubhouse here. And this is where you can see a lot of our, our kids are getting ready to go to camp and they leave today and they return in a week. They also have community programs. Sometimes the dancers come and they'll dance here. One of our um, former therapists, um, Halsey Menendez, he does a lot of art therapy with our children after hours in the evenings sometimes or on weekends to um, help children, you know, paint and express themselves through painting. 
Our people were nomadic. They moved with the seasons. They moved to the river for fishing in summer, then winter out in the Minto Flats, and you know, fall time, uh, they get ready to come back to the village. and uh, They settled, uh, making this a uh, place where the government can come in, uh, put up a school for their people. An individual that I worked with personally out at one of the camps this one person, we, we just got back from duck hunting, and she was looking at me, and she goes, can you teach me how to cut a duck? And I said, yeah. And so I sat down with her, and I showed her how to do it, and she started crying. And, I, and she goes, I always wanted to know how to do this. And that was the strength. And that was a skill that she can take on, but just think what that did to her self-esteem, her self-image as an Indian person. This is our Seven Generation Systems of Care um, logo here. It's a symbol of our Native American children and families living in urban Los Angeles. That's why you see the city in the background here. Puppets have actually a really creative way of bringing out and engaging um, children during therapy. And we also do um, a lot of beadworking, basketry. Um, our agency also has a concrete river drum for men and boys where um, they drum as a means to healing through therapy. As we move forward, the key to improved behavioral health care for indigenous people may be determined by how we address the needs of culture and science. You know, this is a best practice. It is recognized and it is shown to be very effective in providing services to our Native people. These are the same kids, whether they're labeled severely emotionally disturbed, juvenile delinquent, substance abusers, or learning disabled, um, they're the same kids. I'm saying we measure success in different ways. I think it's, uh, we say it's the people that really need it. And, uh, I think we're doing something because it does not affect only Native people, the whole society. And it goes back to, to principles that I learned from Grandma. You know, you gotta, you gotta do what you say you're gonna do. If you say you're gonna do something, you gotta do it. For a lot of the people that are coming back, they really want to come back because they know they learned something and it's family oriented and that, that's the big, big component. And in truth, the most effective way to work with American Indian people, generally speaking, is when we're utilizing traditional philosophies and our own language and our own perspectives with the best of what modern medicine has to offer. Hey.